Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining Informed Perspectives, Race and Religion in China. Today's webinar is hosted by the Religion, Race and Democracy Lab at the University of Virginia. I am Jia Liang, postdoctoral fellow in Asian Religion and Cultures at Denison University and a research fellow with the Religion, Race and Democracy Lab at the University of Virginia. This program is a continuation of the lab series, Informed Perspectives which brings journalists, documentarians, and humanities scholars into conversation about issues concerning religion, race, and politics. We would like to thank the loose ACLS programs in religion journalism and international affairs for so generously sponsoring the event. Before introducing our guest, I would like to encourage audience members to raise questions throughout our event. To do so, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screens. There will be time at the end of the event to fill some of your questions. We are recording today's webinar, which will be made available on the lab's website, religionlab.virginia.edu next week. A link will also be shared with all attendees via email. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Charles Luffman. Thank you, Jia, um, and good evening, everyone. Um, I'm very pleased to see the great turnout for this evening's event. My name is Charles Laughlin. I'm a professor of East Asian studies. Um, actually, specifically, I'm a professor of Chinese literature, uh, and I'm the chair of the Department of East Asian Languages, Literatures, and Cultures uh, at the University of Virginia here. Um, I'm particularly honored to have been asked to be the moderator uh, for this tonight's conversation. Um, although my role as moderator is basically to get out of the way of the, uh, the attendees and, and the panelists um, and facilitate your conversation. I, I'm honored though, as a professor of modern Chinese literature because um, the um, religious faith is a, an issue that is particularly um, un, untouched, I think, by modern Chinese literature and, and film. Uh, there may be disagreement with that, but I think those uh, exceptions uh, prove the rule. Um, however, I have a few comments about that that I may uh, share with everybody during the conversation after our, uh, after our presentation. So I'm moderating. Uh, Ian Johnson, um, our first guest, is a Pulitzer Prize uh, winning writer focusing on society, religion, and history. Uh, he was awarded a 2020-2021 National Endowment for the Humanities Public Scholars um, Fellowship for a new book he's writing on China's unofficial history. Uh, Catherine Hardy, our other guest, is assistant professor uh, in the Department of uh, Translation, Interpreting, and Intercultural Studies at Hong Kong Baptist University. Her research lies at the intersection of the Tibetan and Chinese cultural worlds uh, inside the PRC with a particular focus on contemporary Han Chinese involvement in Tibetan Buddhism. Um, so first, uh, each of our um, speakers will deliver some remarks um, and then we'll follow that with a, converse, a brief conversation among ourselves, um, but we'll be collecting and organizing the questions that come from you all. Uh, and so at, at, the, uh, at the end, we'll leave plenty of time um, for the panelists to address your questions. And now I'd like to welcome Ian Johnson to join us. Okay, well, thanks very much, everybody. Good morning, I'm in Singapore right now. And um, I'm going to be giving a bit of an overview uh, lecture. I guess that's why I'm, I'm uh, hitting lead off uh, to talk a little bit about the state of religion in China, especially the contemporary situation uh, in the new era. Um, so let me share with you a little PowerPoint that I have um, that has some Need little pictures and stuff like that. And so, um, yeah, I wanna talk, first of all, um, the first part of my talk is, is about the return of religion. Um, and I, this is gonna be super fast and, and uh, unfortunately, you know, almost uh, with a lot of simplifications, but I think it's fair to say, and I think most people would agree that Starting in the mid to late 19th century, there was a top-down secularizing effort that began in China. Um, so in other words, led by elites 
who felt um, not without cause that China was in the midst of a catastrophic uh, change that had uh, challenged many, many assumptions about Chinese society, faith, belief, um, values, culture, and that this was something maybe different than what the Chinese civilization had experienced previously, that the incursion of the West um, signified obviously at the beginning by the opium wars, but then just a steady stream of, of invasions and, and um, yeah, you could say humiliations, even though that word has been sort of appropriated by the Communist Party, but um, that these have, um, these challenged many, many assumptions. And I think one of the things was, was caused a great amount of self-doubt um, in Chinese institutions. And religion was really at the center of this. Um, now, when we think of the standard discourses on Chinese history, we normally think about um, various other things that took place in the 19th century, but the assault on religion was often underlying it, or religion and, and, and counter pushes in society were, uh, from religious groups were part of this, um, or really at the center of it. Um, and that is because like in many societies in the world, religion was at the center of Chinese society. Religious, um, religion and politics were intertwined in a way that was hard to separate. Um, Prasen Jadwara calls temples the nexus of power in traditional China. And so when reformers were going after, uh, trying to change Chinese society in the 19th and 20th centuries, they realized that they couldn't just sort of switch out maybe the emperor or something like that. They had to also go after religion. So starting even in the, in the reforms of 1898, there was a proposal to convert uh, temples into schools. So the idea that these temples were full of sort of um, superstitious nonsense that was not really helping China. China needed science and China needed uh, a literate public uh, population in order to uh, strengthen itself and stand up to the West and in, also probably to Japan, which was coming up on the horizon as well. Um, you know, which religions am I talking about? At this time, Islam was, or still is, a relatively small religion in terms of the population. Um, and uh, Christianity was not very big at the time. The major religions that they took we're taking aim at were the sort of so-called traditional religions of Buddhism, Taoism, and a big amorphous uh, group of beliefs and practices that we can call folk religion. So, um, and, and this is symbolized, for example, by Sun Yat-sen, who was you know, credited with overthrowing the Qing dynasty in 1911, leading that revolution when he was a young man going into the temple in his local uh, village with a stick and um, smashing a statue and saying, I thought the gods were powerful. And so symbolizing that these are just, this is nothing. Um, uh, so the KMT, which took over the Guomindang, the Nationalist Party, um, they continued this secularizing effort. Uh, there was a new life movement and young people went out into the countryside and often tried to dismantle um, temples uh, religion began to be viewed as a social ill, something akin to opium smoking or foot binding, something that had to be solved in order for China to become modern. Um, and then obviously the KMT was not in power for very long before it was engulfed by war, the invasion from Japan, then the civil war, and then the communists took over and they continued this top-down modernizing process. And just like the KMT, they began to organize religion into committees and, and uh, sort of church-like structures. And they gave us what we have today is the five official religions of China, or the five official religious groups, I would say, uh, Buddhism, Taoism, Islam, and Christianity is divided into two groups, Protestantism and Catholicism. Um, this only lasted for a few years in the 1950s and then began what is euphemistically called um, 20 years of leftist excesses, beginning sort of with the Great Leap Forward, uh, the anti rightist campaign, the Great Leap Forward, and then sort of blending into the Cultural Revolution and only really ending with Mao's death in 1976.
Um, after that, uh, when Deng Xiaoping takes power and there's the you know, reform and opening period that's sort of officially, you could say, timed as starting around 1978, you have a, um, a return of religion. I haven't even advanced my slides here. Um, and this return is uh, symbolized maybe in this picture where more and more people began to practice religion. The party's view was still that religion was a problem, that religion would go away, but instead of say forcing it closed and uh, they would just allow it to die a natural death that as society progressed and we moved from socialism to communism, the people would become enlightened, they'd become prosperous, they'd become uh, better educated, and they wouldn't really need all this uh, religious mumbo jumbo to get through the day. So I think uh, in this sort of symbolized by this document 19 that was released, I think it was 1982 or maybe it was 81, um, they uh, foresaw religion, they allowed religion to come back, they opened up seminaries and, and training uh, facilities, institutes for monks and nuns and priests, but there was no expectation that what religion would really take off. Um, and yet it did take off. And as you can see, this picture is not atypical. It's a, it's a, a well-dressed person with a uh, Gucci, I think, Gucci handbag, and the temple is kind of full. Um, and, and you can see these scenes all around China today where religion is um, widely practiced despite many crackdowns, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, and I think that this sort of carried on more or less uninterrupted despite occasional crackdowns on house churches on underground uh, religious groups um, on measures against say the Dalai Lama or the crackdown on the Falun Gong spiritual movement in the late 1990s. But it sort of carried on up until the late 2000s, say beginning around 2010. I think it's simplistic to date all this with Xi Jinping taking power in 2012. There was already an expect, a feeling that society needed to be, society as a whole needed to be reined in a little bit better and that there needed to be some measures taken that, that um, the government had allowed things to sort of go too far um, in, in civil society as well as religion or religion being maybe part of civil society. Um, so this, starting with Xi Jinping's assumption to power, um, there's just a few other pictures, go through them really quickly and get to our main actor in this, uh, in this part of the talk, uh, Xi Jinping, when he takes over in 2012, he calls for a new spiritual rejuvenation of China. And um, uh, as symbolized by the Chinese dream, but he also began to more forcefully and explicitly endorse the so-called traditional religions in China. Uh, the party still pushed model workers and model uh, communist heroes like this person, Lei Feng. Um, but, by, but it also, I think, recognized that it needed to have a, a, a broader message that would appeal to more, more people. The people like Lei Feng were not terribly convincing. They seemed sort of passe, but the government still realized that society needed some sort of moral basis. And so it began to um, embrace not just Confucius, but um, also, uh, and here it actually is Xi Jinping and Chufu in 2013, when he declares that Confucius has a lot of good things that are worth studying and worth learning. And that's the Chufu party secretary next to him, looks like he's having a heart attack. Um, and, um, and here he is meeting a prominent Buddhist um, abbot, <clears throat> the head of Fo Guangshan, which is a Taiwanese Buddhist mission missionizing uh, organization that has been allowed to come to mainland China and open up uh, temples, libraries, uh, cultural centers and things like that. And I had a chance to talk to, to uh, him about this. Um, also the government began to push public education with an explicit moral content, moral, a moral content that uh, included 
sort of uh, broader ideas, like on the, the propaganda poster on the right about cultural self-confidence, but also embracing sort of Neo-Confucian ideas uh, coming from the philosopher Wang Yang Ming and putting this up on billboards um, around China. And um, I think, that, again, this is a support for some religions um, such as uh, Taoism, Buddhism and practices like this, these kind of folk religious practices that you can see, many of them were declared to be superstitious in the earlier communist era, uh, earlier as in say, even in the reform and opening up era in the 80s and 90s, but gradually became redefined as folk practices. And this one is even gets intangible cultural heritage uh, status, which is a, uh, something borrowed, a term borrowed from the United Nations to um, allow some religions or some, some practices to get financial support from the government. Um, now, I want to keep my remarks very brief so we can go on to Catherine and then have a discussion. But these are more shots of the of a pilgrimage outside Beijing, which gets government support every year. The pilgrimage itself gets support and the groups that go and perform there, they're given support. Um, they're not doing it for financial gain. They're doing it because they have a belief that this is important and the government support is more symbolic. It maybe amounts to $1,000 a year, but when you divide it among 30 people and have to rent a bus and buy costumes and stuff for people every year or renew them and so on and so forth, it doesn't really go very far. But it's something that is that is sort of um, an important symbolic change. The idea that this is now embraced and supported by the government. And there I am participating in one, actually. Um, other, you can see a huge amount of temple construction going on in China. Um, and then finally, problems with foreign faiths. And I think maybe we can leave that a little bit for the um, Q&A session, but we have uh, clearly a campaign that's gone on against, uh, well, against Protestantism and then Islam as well. And I think the uniting feature here is that these groups are seen as having too many or problematic foreign ties, the Catholic Church to the Vatican, Protestantism through the global Protestant community, which often supports um, uh, Protestants in China, and Islam through the global Ummah and neighboring countries, the pilgrimage to Mecca, etc. And so we've seen obviously a campaign against uh, Uyghurs, which has an anti-Islamic element to it as well. Uh, and so I think this is in line with broader crackdowns on civil society against NGOs as well. So um, I guess I'm going to just leave it uh, here and then move uh, allow Charles to come in and start um, a conversation and then we'll move on to Catherine. So thanks very much for that. Thank you very much, Ian. Um, uh, it's hard to compress uh, your all of the knowledge that you've gathered over over such a long time into such a brief period of time, but we appreciate the, the vast overview um, from 30,000 feet. Now I'd like to welcome Catherine Hardy to join us next. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction, Charles. Um, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm really glad to be here and taking part in this conversation today. And uh, thank you everyone who has tuned in. So I thought that I would take as my point of departure Ian's remarks just now about the tendency of the Chinese state to favor religions that are deemed to be sinicized and use this as a way into discussing the positionality and character of Tibetan Buddhism in the PRC today. So one of the main things that we're concerned with this afternoon are the entanglements of ethnicity, religion, and politics in mainland China. And Tibetan Buddhism provides an interesting case study. Uh, the reason I say this is that with Tibetan Buddhism, we have a religion that is of non-Han Chinese uh, origin and with foreign ties in terms of the uh, links between uh, the exile community uh, in, uh, uh, in South Asia. Um, and 
a religion that in the last two decades has made more popular inroads in Han Chinese society than ever before. Now, to be sure, Han Chinese is an officially recognized branch of PRC Buddhism. It has its own sub-branch within the Buddhist Association of China. There are nearly 4,000 legally registered uh, Tibetan Buddhist monasteries in China and a monastic population legally registered numbering in the tens of thousands. Yet notwithstanding its orthodox Buddhist status, Tibetan Buddhism remains an ethnic minority religion in China. And by this, I mean that the Chinese state defines Tibetan Buddhism as practiced only by Tibetans and a few other geographically contiguous ethnic minorities. So official statistics for Tibetan Buddhism, as with Islam, really are grounded in the assumption that all members of an ethnic group are adherents to a particular religion. Unofficially, uh, or, however, or at a grassroots level, Tibetan Buddhism uh, in the last two decades or more has become an extremely active missionary religion in mainland China. As the spiritual cachet of Tibetan Buddhism has surged among a largely middle to upper class Han Chinese urban demographic, a lively Sinophone Tibetan Buddhist scene has spread throughout the Chinese urban religious landscape. Loosely organized, informal lay Han Chinese patron disciple networks centered on charismatic Tibetan lamas have proliferated, with mobile religious networking taking shape as Tibetan lamas' characteristic mode of religious outreach. Throughout the 2010s, the advent of smartphones and social networking technologies has spurred on this missionary momentum, leading Tibetan Buddhism to massively expand its constituency of Han Chinese converts and sympathizers. Um, it's difficult to, uh, uh, to, to ascertain the precise scope of this phenomenon, um, but unofficial estimates suggest that uh, between several hundred thousand and up to several million uh, Chinese people may be involved in Tibetan Buddhism. Now, while this might only represent a very tiny proportion of the PRC's estimated total of 240 million Buddhists, it's nonetheless evidence of Tibetan Buddhism's considerable advances, religious advances in recent years. And of course, it goes without saying that from the perspective of a minority religion of six to eight million adherents, an increase in convert followers of this uh, magnitude is of immense significance. And this is especially so in view of the generous financial patronage that this affluent demographic has provided for the reconstruction of Tibetan monastic communities during the post-Mao revival of Tibetan Buddhism. Um, Ashley, could you please show my first slide? So over the course of my research into Han Chinese involvement in Tibetan Buddhism in the last decade, my focus has been on, on, on this place. Uh, what has emerged in the post-Mao era as undoubtedly the most influential hub in the Sinophone Tibetan Buddhist world. Um, its name is the Seta Larong Five Sciences Buddhist Academy. Uh, it's better known as Larongar. Um, some of you may indeed have seen pictures before, of it before and it's, it's certainly a, a visually arresting sight. Um, next slide please Ashley. Um, oh, that's another, another picture from another vantage point. Next slide, please, Ashley. So just to take a look at this map, we can see that it's actually located towards the east of the Tibetan plateau in the far west of Sichuan province. Now, what's significant about this part of the Tibetan plateau is that in the um, last few decades, the restrictions on monastic Buddhism have generally been less onerous than in the Tibetan autonomous region. And this is an important factor in explaining the size to which this institution um, has grown and um, indeed it's, the autonomy that it has enjoyed for a large amount of its history. Now, first and foremost, Larunga is celebrated in Tibetan areas for its powerful role in the revival of Tibetan Buddhism in the wake of the Cultural Revolution, and as a bastion of Tibetan religious-centered ethno-cultural identity. Um, next slide, please, uh, Ashley. Um, uh, next slide. Uh, maybe next slide. Thanks. 
So it grew rapidly from a very small religious encampment at the beginning of the 1980s into the world's most populous Tibetan Buddhist center of scriptural learning and practice by the 1990s. While traditionalist in its ethos, it's also demonstrated significant progressiveness and innovation in a number of respects, most notably in its unprecedented commitment to educational and religious parity between male and female practitioners. Significantly, over half of uh, Larungar's monastic community is comprised of Tibetan nuns. Now, at the same time that Larungar has nurtured Tibetan spiritual capital in and for the Tibetan world, it has also been an unrivaled missionary force in Han Chinese society. The momentum began in the late 1980s and early 1990s when Larungar's founding teacher decided to establish a division in his community for Han Chinese practitioners, which grew over time and put Larungar on the map as a rare, hospitable Sino-Tibetan Buddhist community on the Tibetan plateau. Um, next slide, please. Um, oh, these are some pictures from the uh, Tibetan Sanghas at Larongar. Next slide, please, Ashley. Uh, yes, this is a picture from uh, 1992 of the early Han Chinese Sangha at, uh, at, uh, at Larongar. So, of course, there's a lot of history to be told around the development of this community at Laronga, but let and its um, impact on the wider spread of Tibetan Buddhism in mainland China. But uh, let it suffice to say for now that the second generation Tibetan disciples of the founding Lama of this institution expanded on his missionary engagement of uh, Han Chinese audiences primarily through their utilization of the internet to teach lay Buddhists about Tibetan Buddhism in the Chinese language. Um, next slide, please. So these are pictures from La Runga, uh, of Han Chinese lay Buddhists who have uh, flocked there to take part in an annual Dharma assembly. Um, and uh, when in normal circumstances, this is uh, generally an event that tens of thousands of practitioners from inland China attend. Um, in fact, uh, such was the missionary progress, you might say, that uh, Larongar made through the uh, 2010s that one of its uh, leading teachers in particular achieved considerable fame as an internet religious celebrity in Han Chinese society. But if we zoom back out from Larunga now to consider the missionary footprint of uh, Tibetan Buddhism in Han, Han China as a whole, one might reasonably ask what has been the attitude of the Chinese state towards Tibetan Buddhism's expanded religious influence in China proper. And I think it's important or indeed essential to point out in this con connection that China's religious policies generally prohibit Tibetan lamas from disseminating religion beyond their home ethnic regions. And furthermore, just like all religious professionals in China, they are restricted by law from proselytizing outside legally authorized premises. So this means when they travel to mainland China, the fact that they lack a state sanctioned institutional base from which to operate deprives their outreach activities of legal status and leaves them open to suppression at any time. So as a consequence of these restrictions, as scholars such as Alison Denton Jones and Dan Smyo, you have noted, most Tibetan lamas travel to and stay in Chinese cities in a private capacity and engage with followers in private spaces. So unlike in North America, there are no open to the public Tibetan Buddhist Dharma centers or organizations in Chinese cities. Now, um, oh, uh, you can end the share. Thank you, Ashley. For the greater part of the last three decades, however, this paradigm of, of outreach has proved quite viable. Uh, periodic crackdowns on group activities, of course, have not been uncommon. Um, but to the degree that Tibetan Buddhist teachers and their Han Chinese lay networks have remained domestically based and financed, loosely organized, and careful to steer clear of Tibetan exile-related politics, their existence until recent times uh, has been broadly tolerated by authorities. 
uh, most fieldwork informants I know, however, would concur that the missionary golden age, if we might call it that, of the mid-2010s, which was buoyed on by the relatively unregulated state of Chinese cyberspace, has now passed. Um, the extent to which this is due to a specific targeting of, by the authorities of Tibetan Buddhism overstepping its boundaries or to the more general tightening of restrictions on religious life and civil society and internet usage under the Xi administration is, is difficult to say. Nevertheless, in the eyes of many Han Chinese Buddhist practitioners and their Tibetan lamas, this is a highly disappointing development. Many had watched the overall thrust of Chinese state discourse on Buddhism's role in mainstream Han Chinese society become more positive and accepting throughout the 2000s. While Tibetan Buddhism enmeshed as it is in volatile geopolitics and sensitive issues of ethnic minority governance, and tainted by associations of primitiveness and superstition has had been marginalized from these um, Han-centric conceptions of positive Buddhism. Tibetan Buddhism's growing profile in Han Chinese society in the 2010s was interpreted by many as a tentative sign of increasing top-down recognition of Tibetan Buddhism's mainstream legitimacy. Now, while it seems that Xi Jinping's formal requirement that Tibetan Buddhism, like other religions, must sinicize in order to meet the standards of political orthodoxy, while it would seem that this suggests that Tibetan Buddhism remains relegated or has been re-relegated to the status of a um, foreign linked borderland religious tradition, I'd like to point out that on a grassroots level at least, in the hearts and minds of hundreds and thousands of ordinary Han Chinese practitioners throughout China and beyond, Tibetan Buddhism is more beloved and familiar than ever. And uh, I would just like to leave with the observation, end with the observation that when one compares this situation to Islam, which is a similarly ethnic religious tradition that sees very, very few Han Chinese converts, the difference is striking. So when we compare the positionalities of Tibetans and Uyghurs in the contemporary PRC, as we might find ourselves doing, it's worth bearing in mind this avenue of cultural integration that exists in the former case, but not in the latter. Thank you very much. Thank you, Catherine. Um, and uh, uh, thank you all for uh, beginning to write in questions. Um, we have another almost uh, 45 minutes in, in our session today, and so we'd like to start out um, just by uh, discussing a, a few issues amongst ourselves here. Um, one thing I see that is really nice in the balance between Ian and Catherine's presentations are that Ian has got this uh, vast, comprehensive, overarching view of the, um, the resurgence of religious faith of all different kinds. Uh, in China over the last, say, 25, 35 years, uh, whereas uh, Catherine is looking at a very specific phenomenon. Um, and yet, uh, I think in Catherine's very specific phenomenon, you get a lot of very broad general themes, the relationship between the grassroots level. I think interest in Tibetan Buddhism among Han Chinese, I think, is largely initially a grassroots interest, word of mouth, friends, uh, uh, things like that. And this is something that I think uh, Ian in his book, 2017 book, uh, Souls of China, uh, also um, relies upon a great deal as a, as a methodology, right? He's talking to people who are doing things in their own local communities um, and, and only uh, uh, distantly viewing government intervention or, or suppression as the case may be, or support uh, as, as the case may also be. Um, one of the things that struck me about Ian's book is, is uh, relates to this idea of, of um, what do we mean when we say religion? Because uh, he has a section where he's talking about how um, global like um, um, statistics on on religion in China are are um, skewed uh, by the fact that um, pollsters who are unfamiliar with Chinese culture will ask questions that will lead people uh, to say things about their beliefs. Uh, that indicate that they, they are not religious and they don't have a spiritual life when that in fact is not the case. Um, and so this is one of the ways in which I think 
what's great about Ian's book, uh, uh, and and also I think relates to the Tibetan uh, interest in Tibetan Buddhism among Han Chinese, is is this sense of you know what people need and, and how it's satisfied, not necessarily fitting into a Euro-American idea uh, of what religion is and what religious practices. I wonder if each of you could comment on that first. Me to go first, or um, sure. Okay, I mean, I would say that China, in some ways, I think Chinese people are very similar to to Western people in that, uh, but for different reasons. There's a, um, a I don't say mistrust or a skepticism about quote unquote organized religion that um, that many people will say that they have faith and belief. Um, but that they don't necessarily follow one religion, you know, in Chinese, it's own jiao. And so they'll use these things kind of as part of a smorgasbord of, um, of belief and ideas. And I don't mean this to belittle this in any way, but, um, and, and maybe Tibetan Buddhism, Catherine can, can you know, can, can say what she thinks about this, but I, I, it feels like, to, at least to the people I've met uh, and talked to, it was part of this, um, you know, palette of, of beliefs and ideas. Many of the people who went to that pilgrimage that I showed pictures of, um, they'd also driven their cars or, or Jeeps to Tibet, you know, and or flown up there and, and uh, circumambulated um, holy mountains and done stuff like that, you know, and then, and, and maybe had a little Tibetan Buddhist prayer wheel hanging in their car mirror. Um, but it wasn't necessarily that they were like the most pious Tibetan Buddhists or that they, they certainly didn't care about the Dalai Lama or, you know, <laughs> Tibetan culture in a deeper way, but they, they used it. And in some ways it sort of reminded me of people in, in America and maybe they, this isn't so much the case anymore, but because I think there's more sensitivity toward cultural appropriation and stuff like that. But, you know, who would say, oh, I, you know, I, I, I'm a believer in, um, you know, Native American practices and, and, and I, you know, do this, that, or the other thing, or, and they, you know, dabble in a little bit of Zen Buddhism on the side and write haikus and, you know, do a little bit of calligraphy or something like that. And again, it's, I think people find meaning in however they want to, I'm not, I'm not judging it, but I mean, there is a sort of modern idea that I can sort of pick and choose stuff um, and uh, maybe celebrate a Passover Seder and then also, uh, you know, do something at Easter or something like that. I don't know. Um, so that, in that, that sense, I think Chinese people and Western people are part of this maybe postmodern society where beliefs and, and values and stuff are sort of fungible. And uh, so that would be my initial response. Those are some great examples. I think there has been actually uh, in the American uh, public, uh, maybe not quite as prominent now as it had as it was maybe 15 years ago, an interest in Tibetan Buddhism. Um, among, oh, yeah. uh, let's say, like the, the young, like sort of rock and roll, hip hop community, things like that. Um, and it kind of fulfills that role. And, and this is not to make light of it, because I think what you're talking about, and I think what is relevant to this discussion is um, the, the fact that there are needs that are not being met um, in, in people's lives. And in the Chinese case, in the mainland Chinese case, this, this failure to meet needs is largely the responsibility of, of you know, socialist culture. And what you talked about at the beginning of your talk of the, um, not only the communist party and the PRC, but this long arc since the 19th century of a kind of assault on, on traditional religions, creating a vacuum, right? That, um, um, that all kinds of different things come into to fill. Um, before you comment on that though, I wanna see what Catherine has to say about uh, the original question. Uh, yeah, thank you, Ian and Charles. I, look, I would broadly agree with what um, Ian had to say as a general phenomenon, except I think that what you do find in uh, among Han Chinese followers of Tibetan Buddhism and perhaps, uh, you know, a greater, yes, a much greater uh, influence of normative and orthodox Buddhism. And so the concept of being an inherent of Buddhism, being taking refuge, calling oneself a Buddhist, um, that being your um, exclusive uh, religious identity is much more prevalent. Um, and certainly given that Larongar itself is really, uh, I mean, a touchstone, you might say, of orthodoxy in the Tibetan Buddhist world, this is something that is, um, you know, strongly emphasized in that community. 
Now, what that actually means, though, in terms of people's practices, um, I think is another thing. And I, I, you know, from the point of view that uh, they are, we are uh, all participants, as you point out, in a, you know, a, in the postmodern, uh, you know, condition. I think that there are there is still quite a lot of com combining, uh, quite a, still a lot of availing oneself from a broader cultural palette at the level of practice, you know, uh, at the level of identity, though, um, my observation is very much a tendency uh, uh, among uh, Chinese followers of Tibetan Buddhism, at least committed followers, um, to certainly to, um, to, to, to call oneself, to identify one as, as a Buddhist. Now, that might not necessarily be a Tibetan Buddhist. Generally, indeed, uh, most people have an idea of that, that, that you know, being a Buddhist means that, um, you know, that you can uh, make use of the resources of different traditions. And so therefore, and, and that is indeed taught by uh, many Tibetan Buddhist teachers as well. There's a strong sort of ecumenical flavor, you might say, um, among many uh, Tibetan Buddhist teachers outreach efforts in China. Um, so, uh, but of course, you know, I think with as in any religious, uh, you know, culture or community or scene, you're going to have people who are highly committed. And then you're going to have, um, you know, a continuum, a gradation of people whose uh, commitments are perhaps less intense and then for more likely to um, maybe, you know, order their identity or distribute their religious life in, um, you know, in different kinds of ways. And so, you know, and certainly very much, I think, look, I think the other thing in, in Tibetan areas, you know, Tibet in general embodies a certain a spiritual allure for a very wide uh, category or a wide class of Han Chinese urban people, not just for Buddhists as such. And so I do think that um, many people do partake of Tibet's spiritual culture, whether that be through pilgrimage practices or tourism or um, uh, you know, a certain accoutrements, or using certain accoutrements and that kind of thing without, you know, really without necessarily feeling that they might even have to call themselves a Buddhist, that it's sort of, again, part of that palette of resources that they might make use of. A certain detail I'm curious about uh, for Catherine is whether you have looked at the Han Chinese engagement with Tibetan Buddhism in comparison with Han Chinese engagement with other strains of Buddhism like Chan or Zen Buddhism. Um, my awareness of that is um, pretty much limited to my reading of, of, of secondary materials. Um, and, but I, I mean, one thing I would say is that when we look at just the statistics, uh, I mean, of course, they're unofficial estimates of uh, the scale of Han Chinese participation in Tibetan Buddhism. Clearly, this is, a, you know, it's, of course, I guess, if it's, let's just say it's two or three million people, that's really by, I don't know, Western standards, still a lot of people. And it is a lot of people relative to the number of Tibetan Buddhists in China. But vis-a-vis -vis the wider so-called Buddhist uh, population in China, it's a, you know, it's a drop in the ocean. At the same time, though, um, I think there is an argument to be made that potentially Han Chinese followers of Tibetan Buddhism are more committed Buddhists and that that 200 million figure that is uh, thrown around refers to people whose uh, affiliations with or involvements in Buddhism can be quite diffuse. Um, and so I think that to make a fair comparison, it would be necessary to compare committed Chinese uh, followers of Buddhism, perhaps, you know, with, with masters who, who connect themselves with particular monastic institutions or have, you know, lay teachers or monastic teachers, whatever it may be, in, in any case, committed followers with, uh, and, and sort of, I, I feel that that sort of um, might be a sort of a fairer basis on which to draw a comparison, because I think that you've just got far more diversity and a far greater spectrum of ways of doing Buddhist and being Buddhist among that, you know, that huge population. Yeah, I asked that sort of because anecdotally over the years in Chengdu, for instance, I've noticed a great increase in activity at the Wen Shu uh, mm -hmm. which is a non-Tibetan Buddhist uh, monastery. Um, but I wasn't sure what to make of it, whether it was a reflection of real 
uh, spiritual engagement and religious faith, or if it's just kind of like a um, a a um, a popular sort of focus of new attention. Uh, uh, because what I saw a lot of was plaques that were put up um, thanking uh, donors, basically, uh, for contributing to the expansion and 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 remodeling of, of this major you know Buddhist temple in, in Chengdu, uh, which in a way to me reminds me of some of what Ian is talking about in his book, sort of a uh, a return uh, to uh, forms of religious practice, uh, which are not entirely matters of the soul, right? It, it, it's also a matter of re resituating the community and, and and redefining cultural identity and things like that among Han Chinese. Um, mm, mm. Yeah, I mean, I look. I think in general, those practices are also very observable. Observable in in Han Chinese involvement in Tibetan Buddhists too. A lot of patronage of um, um, donations to monastic communities, and so uh, very much, um, you know, taking the upon oneself the role of a pious lay supporter of the monastic community. Um, the idea of you know accumulating merit, you know, of karmic recompense. Um, you know, lay subjectivities, piety, all of these things. I think they're equally observant there. I think, though, one thing I will say is, um, and this specifically relates to Laronga, but mm, it's not exclusively uh, something that's only found at Laronga. One of the complaints that many uh, Chinese people have when they potentially cross over to Tibetan Buddhism from initial exposure to Chinese Buddhism is that they have not found sufficiently um, challenging or, or spiritually rewarding modalities of religious engagement offered to them um, you know, at monasteries and that they have been engaged as lay supporters when they have a, you know, they have a desire to study, uh, you know, for I guess, you know, for, for rigorous spiritual practice, to study texts, to learn meditation methods, to set oneself on the path to enlightenment. Um, and that's a very, very strong discourse, certainly in among the Han Chinese uh, community of lay followers that's centered on Larunga. Thank you. Um, I'm looking at the time here. I, I just had one other topic to cover before we go over to the um, attendee questions was to sort of shift from Buddhism to, to Christianity. So I suppose it will be more uh, uh, Ian's area, although if, if Catherine has, has views on this, I'm interested in it because I think the opening um, uh, remarks that Ian made maybe uh, covered the, the Christian experience in China less uh, than the Buddhist, Taoist and Confucian piece um, but the, the Christian experience, both as a part of modern Chinese history and also as a part of the resurgence of religious faith in China is, is substantial, right? And, and I think it's a really interesting aspect of, uh, of, of uh, the research. Um, Ian? Yeah, well, Christianity was uh, really quite small in China. I mean, it has a long history um, and it has had a permanent presence in China for about 400 years since Matteo Ricci arrived, but um, it, it was a lot, uh, it was quite small until uh, the 19th century, then the influx of missionaries. But even then I would say, you know, in 1949, there were only about 1 million Protestants and 3 million Catholics. And I saw somebody in the question and answer area asked a question about Catholicism. And I could just sort of say that I think since 1949 Catholicism has just tracked population growth. Um, and so there are roughly 10 million Catholics in China today. Uh, so that has been um, a problem which is sort of complicated and, um, and, and one can get into, but it has also to do with why the Vatican is engaging in this uh, outreach to the Communist Party and trying to you know, work with them and, and, and rebuilding the clergy. But, uh, but Protestantism really took off uh, from 1 million followers to today, you know, the, I, I would say, I would go for lower estimates, but sort of 40, 50, 60 million, something there, uh, the, the clearly Protestantism. And I think this fits into um, the idea that when you've had cultural dislocation, that these global missionizing religions often can come in very strongly. Uh, there's a, a sociologist in, in Beijing, Li Fan, who's done work on model atheist counties in China. They're model atheist counties, uh, model atheist counties in the Mao era, and then 
overlaid Protestantism over that. And you can see the explosion of Protestantism in those counties because the traditional religious infrastructure was kind of destroyed and it's like clear cutting a forest, you know, and then new, something new will come up. Um, and, and maybe in some ways, this is what Tibetan Buddhism, I'm just as a speculating, but maybe it offers this by having these kinds of um, clear ritual structures. It's something that, that appeals to people. I mean, I don't know, but, um, but, but it strikes me that what is appealing often in a time of uncertainty are, are things that are very certain or, or, or structured. Um, as Falun Gong offered that also 20 years ago um, and Christianity today. Thank you. Um, just to do justice to the number of questions rolling in from the attendees, I, I think I'm going to switch over to that now. Um, and so I have a first question, really good question, I think, for both of you. Um, with the developments in the whole range of issues in the Xi Jinping area, era of, of China, do you think religious governance in China is returning to the time of the Cultural Revolution? What are the parallels and what is different from that era? Uh, would you like to study? <laughs> uh, okay, well, I would just say probably no, it's not going back to the Cultural Revolution. It's probably trying to go back with a lot of things in Xi Jinping. I often think he's trying to go back to his father's era, you know, the early to mid 1950s when the Communist Party was full of upright, motivated members, and they sort of had this structure of uh, five religious groups and everybody was a member of them or supposed to be a member of the, of them and that the party led society but it didn't it didn't you know in the Mao era especially in that sort of 20 year period from the late 50s or mid to late 50s until he died um, religion became more and more persecuted until there's basically no public religious life and there's not that's not the case today I mean there's still there's still religious life in China it's just harder and harder to have unregistered especially unregistered churches or mosques um, and anything that has size or scale so if it's really just a house church that kind of thing it's still okay but if you try to have a big and there were many of these mega churches that had hundreds of members and seminaries and kindergartens and stuff like that. And they were not registered with the government. They were underground, but they had hundreds and those sort of things are being closed. Uh, so I think it's an effort to reassert control, but not to go back to the Cultural revolution. Thank you, Catherine. Um, I, you know, I would agree with that. I think the um, certainly something that I have witnessed in, uh, you know, in the Tibetan, well, at least among Han Chinese followers of Tibetan Buddhism, the, yes, certainly this idea that uh, excessive organizational presence has been uh, repressed. And so there is then this idea that to the extent that one is loosely organized, informal, practice is largely private, then it's tolerated, but organizations as such uh, will not be. And now, of course, that's difficult for people from the point of view that organizations are what, you know, mediate between the private and the public. They're, you know, part of religious life. So that's, you know, experienced as um, extremely disappointing and upsetting. Um, I will, though, I think the a salient, uh, like a, a really necessary thing to point out is, or exception to that is, is what we've been saying is obviously what's happening in Xinjiang at the moment, which I think we yeah. could only describe as a return to conditions, something of that nature. Oh, that's a very good point. Agree. Um, yeah. Um, I, I just want to make one more comment on what Catherine said, uh, because I think what's really interesting about the case of Han interest in Tibetan Buddhism is that it, it, it has this very productive and interesting tension between government control or suppression or governance of religion on the one hand and popular interest on the other hand, which are you know, it seems like things would have turned out somewhat differently if there wasn't this broad Han Chinese interest in, in Tibetan Buddhism. Um, and it might, in fact, look more like Xinjiang in, in Tibet, although I'm not to say that things are rosy in, in Tibet either. Um, but but uh, this, there, there's an amb ambivalence going on that I think is quite interesting, um, which is, I think, supported also by the overall uh, resurgence of interest in um, in religious faith. So I think the question is motivated by an, a comparison of Xi Jinping to Chairman Mao, um, which is a little bit inaccurate and not to speak in defense of Xi Jinping, but the emphasis he puts on um, sp uh, spiritual life or the life, you know, uh, it seems to, uh, in his case, um, 
be giving him a way to work with Confucianism, given a way to work with Buddhism uh, that that is not so much the the had had not been so much the experience of the the socialist or what we call the Mao era. Um, uh, moving ahead, though, um, another really good question, uh, specifically I think for Lauren Gar, but also maybe you might have something to say about this, um, and that is how has the COVID pandemic impacted activities at Lauren Gar? Uh, what's it like currently? And then whether Ian has something to say about religious practice in general in China as he observes, whether he knows of there being any impact on uh, religious practice. Mm. Okay, Catherine. Yeah, I, I'm, as far as I know, at the beginning of the pandemic, so back in <clears throat> January or February last year when uh, COVID, uh, the COVID outbreak took place in China, that there was um, a very concerted effort um, maybe sort of similar to what took place during SARS to keep it out of minority areas um, uh, due to the fact that um, hygiene conditions are uh, more challenging, um, demographic issues, you know, compound that. And so Laurel Gar was placed under pretty strict lockdown. Um, and that went, um, you know, as were villages right across Eastern Tibet. So, and indeed not just Eastern Tibet, but the whole of China. Um, as far as I know that, uh, you know, that really went through until, you know, April, May, June, when um, things were considered to be relatively safe again. Um, and then more or less um, religious life has uh, returned to normal, presumably with some element of, um, you know, compulsory mask wearing and, and uh, you know, perhaps some other protocols as well. As far as I know, that's the situation. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's what I think is the case also from what I know. I mean, I, uh, a big test for my in, in the world that I follow will be the sort of big pilgrimage is coming up in uh, uh, May. Um, and I think last year, the pilgrimage like the Miao Feng Chan, that, that mountain that I showed in the slideshow at the end, um, it was closed. It was not allowed. Um, this year, it's supposed to be allowed, but with, but I think you're going to have to register ahead of time if you're going. And they have an online registration. So they're trying to limit the number of people going. So you don't get the tens of thousands going in a day that you, you would have on, on the first day of this festival. Um, and, you know, the, the open question is whether these things become normal um, and that later this is sort of a, an excuse to implement all these things and then later you just keep them out of safety or fire prevention or something like that, you know. And uh, Yeah, the question resonated with my memory. I was in Taiwan at the time, so I don't know how it was covered in the media elsewhere in the world. But one of the really disastrous and shocking moments in the early weeks of the pandemic was in Korea, there was a religious organization where they had a super spreader event that made the Korean case loads just, just rocket up. And, and it really was viewed as a, as a crisis, although um, it, it blew over in a few weeks. And now Korea, I think, is still being hailed as one of the countries that has handled the pandemic particularly well. So I think at this point in time, pandemic's over a year old. Um, I think uh, uh, each country is, has a better idea of how to um, how to how to move back into normal um, practices uh, in a in a in a safe way, but it's probably going to never be go back to what it was before. Uh, next question: uh, um, Here in the U.S., Christian nationalism, especially in the last four to five years, has become the new religious frame that bears uh, racial implications. Uh, in, is China deploying a new Confucianism to build nationalistic sentiments? And what about China's deployment of Confucianism and how much ethnic discourse is involved in that process? Well, I, you know, it, I'd be interested to hear Catherine's view from how this plays out in Tibet, but, or, or in these Tibetan areas, but I feel that the, the government overall is pushing a sort of Han Chinese version of traditions and that so many of the things that you see as being, you know, traditional culture, or as they would say, you know, the, like the beneficial or the excellent sides of traditional culture um, are often, you know, Han Chinese culture. <laughs> and so I think that the potential there is that it further alienates ethnic minorities in China. I mean, I don't think we're sort of at a point where you have, 
uh, Confucian fundamentalists who are have a you know a political party or something like that isn't like the BJP in China. Uh, may, maybe fast forward thirty years and it'll be like that or twenty years. But um, I, I do think that there is sort of though an explosivity that what's being defined as the norm is is, is Han Chinese culture and that everything else is kind of an outlier with maybe like a few things thrown in from you know other other cultures, but not 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 significantly engaging with them. So I, I guess that's what I see the risk in that. Yeah, it's interesting because I think Confucianism can be mobilized as a kind of nationalist discourse. It reminds me of the New Life Movement in the 1930s, which was uh, sort of intellectual pushback from the Kuomintang against the leftism of, of the Communist Party in the 1930s, which used a lot of Confucian values. And of course, the, the history of the Kuomintang and the Republic of China has continued to center itself uh, on, at least in the Kuomintang version, uh, on, on Confucian values. And then again, so, and for somebody who studies the period before 1949 in literature, for example, it, it, it seems odd to see the leader of the, uh, the PRC uh, expressing some kind of interest and in, in reverence for the Confucian legacy and, and, and Confucian values when that was precisely what the Communist Party was trying to overturn and destroy and root out uh, in its uh, in its heyday, um, that's just my comment. Um, for Kat, um, at Tibetan Buddhist centers outside the Tibetan Autonomous Region, uh, like Larongar or at Yongagong in Beijing, are clerics forced to recognize political Tibetan holidays such as Serfs Emancipation Day on March twenty eighth? This is something I'm unfamiliar with, but it's an interesting mm -hmm. question. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm not sure about the situation at Yonghegong in Beijing, but, um, and you know what, I think it would be actually quite difficult to generalize about the situation across eastern Tibet. As far as Larungar is concerned, for a very long time, they enjoyed, you know, so much autonomy really over how they ran their institution. Um, days of that nature were not observed. And to the extent I would imagine that they received a notification from uh, perhaps the religious bureau or the United Front that they should observe it, observe it. It was perhaps given, I don't know, some really kind of the most basic sort of lip service imaginable such that it barely registered, registered a ripple on the, on the population. Um, that was the case there then. Um, as to how things will be moving forward, um, you know, I, I can't say, I can't comment on that. Um, you know, and I, I, I think that one thing that has emerged, um, you know, from studies of monastic communities across uh, the Eastern Tibetan era in the last decade or two is that um, the restrictions um, and the level of intervention on specific religious communities varies actually quite a bit. Um, and so it may be the place, for example, it may be the case, for example, that a monastery that has been quite problematic in a political sense and has therefore been subject to quite a lot of control and restriction and uh, intervention is then subject to these, um, you know, requirements. Um, yeah, I, that's really the best I can say uh, about that. Just as a point of clarity uh, for me, especially um, when you say Eastern Tibet, are you referring to the Tibetan areas of Sichuan and Gansu province and Qing, is Qinghai included in that? Or? Yes, exactly. So basically all of the Tibetan areas that fall under the administration of the neighboring provinces uh, of the Tibetan Autonomous Region. So that's Qinghai, Gansu, Sichuan and, uh, and Yunnan province too. Yunnan, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a question, uh, actually, Jia uh, Liang uh, has uh, done us a favor and combined three questions for both of you. Um, and it looks really interesting. I have seen reports of renewed actions against Buddhist practices in China recently, just in the last six months. For example, statues and murals being covered up either by concrete or paint. Can you opine about how widespread this seems and what this shift in CCP sentiment might mean for the continuing growth of Buddhist practices in China? Uh, there's a couple of follow-up questions, but I'll just leave it at that for now. Mm. Um, certainly in Tibetan areas, there has been a campaign over the last couple of years to um, remove public symbols of, uh, you know, overt conspicuous symbols of Buddhism. And I've, you know, I've witnessed this 
everywhere. Um, and, you know, it is, um, and it varies, you know, I've, I've, I've seen, for example, money stones, which are basically stones that Tibetans, uh, you know, engrave uh, sacred letters onto, painted yeah. over with black paint. Um, you know, I've seen other pictures where, uh, other cases where huge, immense uh, Buddha statues, you know, maybe you know, I actually, I was going to say in meters, but nobody knows meters, um, like uh, very, very tall at any rate, um, have uh, been, you know, the local authorities have demanded that they be covered up. And so there's, you know, been huge scaffoldings wow. built around them to cover them so that they're not, they're not observable from a distance. And when I ask people um, about this, the general response is this is the result of overzealous local governments responding to directives from above. So they receive directives that, you know, tell them that they, you know, that they shouldn't um, have an overly Buddhicized or, uh, you know, religious symbols in public. And then they really take that far. And part of that is a fear from getting in trouble if they don't do the right thing or it could be on the other hand a desire to get in the right books of someone by you know really taking things to the um ultimate limit but um yes uh, this is this happens um a lot yeah i mean i would say in han areas there are many uh examples of of, of uh, buddhist some some taoist um folk religion you know temples being occasionally torn down and, and there was a big Guanyin statue that you know and these are usually um declared to have been illegal illegal construction um and i always see it sort of more in the context in the han areas as being a symbolic counterweight to the tearing off of crosses and so they can say oh yeah. it's not just against christianity look we also tore down this folk religion temple over in Zhejiang, you know and, and they've Occasionally, over the years, over the decades, they tear down these temples, you know, because they, they proliferate, and, and then the government sort of comes in like sort of a, with a like a weed whacker and sort of knocks them back, and then they get rebuilt again. Um, and so I tend to think that it's more like that rather than a stained campaign against uh, Buddhism, Taoism, or folk religion um, in, in the way that it is against, say, Christianity and, and Islam. But um, I may be wrong. Thank you. Um, th there's a question for me and Catherine. I'm not sure why for me, but uh, the question is, did the, did the Kuomintang continue their secularizing mission in Taiwan? Any thoughts on how religious life and development in Taiwan and Hong Kong overall track uh, uh, or how overall compare to contemporary China? I would just say for um, if, if the secularizing mission of the KMT in, uh, 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 in Taiwan is, is refers to the use of uh, Confucian discourse um, to draw people away from other kinds of faith or religious practices that are considered um, superstitious or somehow otherwise harmful to society. I think that's part of the past. Um, I think uh, uh, there's two sides to this. One is that, okay, the Kuomintang continued to rule in, in Taiwan uh, as a kind of a totalitarian regime until like 1986 when the martial law was lifted uh, freedom of the press was instituted and there began to be democratic elections. Certainly after that point in time, religious life in Taiwan is extremely free and open, uh, no matter what your religion is. Uh, there's a lot of evidence of very uh, vibrant uh, religious activity of Confucian type, uh, Buddhist, uh, Christian, uh, Jewish, uh, Islamic. And, and so I, I would say uh, absolutely no to, to that question. Um, any other comments on that, Catherine, since it was also addressed to you? Um, I mean, I would agree with, uh, with, with, um, with what you say. Um, in terms of the, you know, the Buddhist revival, I guess, um, in Taiwan and, you know, by extension, Hong Kong, although Taiwan's really the power center for it. You know, uh, Hong Kong uh, really, really trails trails far in its wake in terms of that. Um, 
has played such a huge role actually in leading the Buddhist revival in the in in, in mainland China, and that's not only in Chinese uh, Mahayana in terms of uh, well, I mean everything you know, modeling ways of organizing, um, you know, modeling ways of practice, establishing social connections, all of that sort of thing. It's also um, you know supplied um, models and inspiration to uh, Tibetan Buddhist teachers and groups in terms of their outreach in, in uh, inland China too. I mean, they are looked at as just being such a successful and inspirational missionary, uh, you know, paradigms, whether it be in terms of their utilization of mass media formats, uh, you know, the cohesiveness of their organizations, the bureaucratization of their organizations. Um, it's uh, made a very significant impact on the development of, of well, Buddhism or Buddhist organization in, in the mainland too. I'm glad you used that opportunity to speak to uh, Buddhism in Hong Kong because you are in Hong Kong and you're at Hong Kong Baptist University. It seemed to me anecdotally, I've seen uh, Christianity it has a very strong institutional footprint in, uh, in Hong Kong, at least until, well, it remains to be seen what's, what's to become of that, but it seems to be very much a part of the DNA of, of Hong Kong as we know it. Um, we're running out of time here, but there is like one other uh, question uh, that's, or there's two questions that have been highlighted. I'll just move down to the next one. Um, so yeah, um, mostly for Kat, if Ian uh, has uh, some way to weigh in here, um, uh, then uh, please do. Three questions with regard to Chinese followers of Tibetan Buddhism. Um, how do Han, Han Chinese followers fit into this social and communal aspect of Tibetan Buddhist monasteries and religion. Are there any traces of institutionalization of practices within those groups um, in form of creating Sangha, informal Dharma groups, et cetera? Uh, among Han Chinese who have recently embraced Tibetan Buddhism, has their relationship to the state or the communist party changed? Uh, how do they contend with the politics of Tibetan Buddhism? Mm. Yeah, they're, look, they're all really great questions. Um, regarding the first one, um, so I would say that there is really a continuum um, in the extent to which Han Chinese practices, practitioners are, you know, accommodated in Tibetan Buddhist uh, institutions in Tibetan areas. Um, the vast majority, in the vast majority of cases, uh, Han Chinese followers perhaps make occasional visits during the summer months, attend uh, prayer festivals or Dharma assemblies that are organized. Um, perhaps an odd practitioner might stay a little bit longer, but generally speaking, their link with Tibetan Buddhism is centered on the Lama and not the institution. And so in a very meaningful way, we really should, I mean, I think it's accurate to describe the spread of Tibetan Buddhism in mainland China as primarily taking place in, an, in a, in a non-institutional way. Having said that, that's not to say that institutions have been dormant forces and Larunga is, you know, a prime example of a place that has uh, incorporated a Han Chinese Sangha, fully institutionalized, fully educationally um, accommodated, ritually accommodated. They have their own Dharma assembly. Um, treasure teachings were revealed by the founding teacher of the community, especially for the benefit of Han Chinese uh, practitioners. Um, and so that would be, you know, at the really far end of the, of the spectrum, a highly integrated institutionalized uh, presence of Han Chinese practitioners in a Tibetan Buddhist community to the extent that I think it would be accurate to call Larongara Sino Tibetan Buddhist community. Um, there are other places, I mean, Yachinga, which is another uh, big religious community in Eastern Tibet where Han Chinese practitioners have had a very noticeable long-term community presence for, um, uh, you know, um, a number of decades, a couple of decades too. Um, and then there are smaller places around the place, but um, generally speaking, um, generally speaking, the, the, the relationship of Han Chinese followers centers on the Lama rather than the monastery. Um, and then regarding the relationship of Han Chinese people, Han Chinese followers who come to Tibetan Buddhism, their relationship between their newfound faith and the politics of the Chinese state, hmm, well, you know, this is an interesting one. I think generally speaking, most, Han Chinese practitioners, you know, 
don't see themselves as uh, political. They're coming to Tibetan Buddhism for spiritual reasons. Um, they find themselves frustrated with the Chinese state to the extent that it represses Tibetan Buddhism. So from the point of view that um, this is, they feel an unjustified religious uh, repression. They don't construe that in the same way, I suppose, as Tibetans do, which as simultaneously a religious repression, but also a repression of their culture, cultural and ethnic identity. Um, in so far as those issues of cultural and ethnic um, and political identity are concerned, most Han Chinese practitioners either keep out of them or they don't hear about them that much because they're largely discussed in the Tibetan language speech community and they don't migrate so much into the uh, Han Chinese, you know, discourse sphere. That's one thing. Um, of course, though, I mean, I think, you know, I, one uh, interesting example, I think, is, um, is again, La Ronga, which um, um, has been subject to um, several quite traumatic demolition campaigns throughout its history. And the last one took place between 2016 and 2017. And during that period, thousands of people were evicted, their houses were um, demolished. And this took was something that was known about, registered, you know, seen, whether in person or through photos, by many, many thousands of Han Chinese practitioners around China who consider La Ronga to be their spiritual home. Um, and I think in that situation that there was, um, again, um, I think, you know, a lot of upset about the fact that this was taking place, but at the same time, a feeling that there was nothing that they could do about it. Um, um, I, I would say that that is, uh, generally speaking, what I what what I've um, what I've observed. Having said that, you know there is, um, you know, increasingly or well, not increasingly, but through over the years, that I've noticed that as you know, Chinese people are not coming to Tibetan Buddhism to find out about Tibetan history, to find out about Tibetan political subjectivities and ethnic grievances. But in the course of their hanging out and, um, you know, being part of this religious community over the years, they find out things, they hear things. And I do find that their um, subjectivities do shift interestingly over the time. Certainly um, new spaces of empathy are opened up. And while that might not mean that uh, Han Chinese practitioners' political, uh, you know, sensibilities mirror or map directly onto those of a typical uh, ethnic Tibetan. Nevertheless, I think that there is, there is a movement that does take place. Thank you. I threw a heavy and complicated question at you and you answered it beautifully. Um, I, I especially like how you uh, talked about how different speech communities are, are, are a factor. Um, and so we're a little over time. So I wanted to toss the microphone back to Ian um, to see if he had um, any overall um, sort of summary comments to make or, uh, or, or, or a response to this specific question. Um, no, I mean, I think, I think this is a really interesting time for observing religion in China. There is a, a clear effort by the government to rein it in and to make it fit more closely into government priorities. Uh, but it remains to be seen, I think, how, how clearly this will take place. I mean, I, th I think there's ten a tendency in general to look at China and, and the government as, as being all powerful and you know, the name of that book, The Perfect Dictatorship and sort of able to do everything it wants. But I think religion is one of those areas that's, that's harder to manage. And that um, it, it's, it's, it's a good paradigm for looking at how effective the state can be in, in implementing its vision. Uh, that's, that's a ter terrific ending. Um, and um, I think um, I want to thank uh, all of you who've stayed up to this point. We've gone over time, but most of you uh, have stayed with us. Um, we had a lot more questions than we were able to uh, ask, but we um, had uh, uh, Jue Liang uh, assistance in, in prioritizing some of them. And I think we covered a lot of different areas um, uh, very effectively.
Um, so I, I want to apologize for any of you who may be waiting to have your, your question addressed and, and it was not done, but I appreciate uh, your interest uh, in this event. Um, and I also want to again, thank uh, Catherine uh, Hardy uh, for joining us as well as Ian Johnson um, for this, this excellent event and uh, encourage you all to uh, stay tuned um, to uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, lab here uh, for further events of, of this type. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Thank you. Yeah, we're well, going to come back. Yes, uh, thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Ian. And thank you, Charles, for engaging us today and with your thoughtful commentary and the discussion. And I'd like to thank our audience for your questions and your participation. We hope you will also join us again on Tuesday, April 6, for the next program in our series a conversation inspired by Anthea Butler's new book, White Evangelical Racism, The Politics of Morality in America. For inf more information, please go to religionlab.virginia.edu events. Thank you.